We'll now move on. We're going to go to 9.0, and tonight is the first reading of the 2020-2021 General Fund Operation Budget. And uh, board, this is for information only, as you know. Yes, if y'all want to leave, you don't have to stay, but you're more than, you can stay, you can leave, you can stay a little while and then leave, you, whatever you want to do. We, we're so glad to see faces if you want to know the truth. Our last four or five meetings, is, we've only had just us. So we're so glad to see y'all. Yeah, thank you. No, we appreciate y'all coming. Thank you. So at this time board, we're going to go to 9.0, which is the first reading of the 2020-2021 proposed general fund operation budget. As you know, by law, we have to have several readings of this budget so that uh, not only that we understand it, but that our community understands it. And to be honest, uh, things are sort of in flux right now with all that we've got going on in the world. So, um, and Mr. Salters is gonna explain a little bit of that. So we're gonna hear about that. So Mr. Salters, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I, uh, as you mentioned, we're going to do the uh, first reading of our uh, proposed general fund budget uh, for 2020-2021. Um, well, let's just make sure Ms. Garris and Dr. Guyton can see this. Um, Ms. Garris and Dr. Guyton, can y'all see the, the presentation? I can't see them. Uh, they can. Okay, great. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Sol all right, thank you. Um, and normally uh, we would be at this meeting, usually in this time of year, we would be doing a second reading of the budget. Um, and, uh, but given the, the state of the coronavirus, it hit right around the beginning of our budget time uh, frame. And um, we uh, would have normally done a first reading in April and, and move forward. But uh, we wanted to push our budget process out just a little bit to see if the state uh, would be making any changes and, um, and, and what they were doing. Uh, and so we're, we're here tonight for first reading. So I'm gonna do my best to not pass out and talk through this with a mask on. So here we go. I'm good. If I can get, if I can get the clicker to work. All right, you're gonna have to click, I guess, Josh, because it's not. Okay. All right. Um, so the, uh, just to recap for you, uh, when we're talking about a general fund budget, um, mainly th these are the operating expenditures for the district. So, um, you know, it, this budget lays out our expected revenues um, and, and expected expenditures on the operation side of our budget. So that's salaries and utility costs and different things like that. Um, and I want to contrast that uh, with our, Josh, go ahead, with our capital funds um, that we get questions about from time to time. Our capital funds uh, focus primarily on um, funds that are restricted by law or bond covenants. Um, and, and these funds are designated uh, for our major building projects. You know, 2018, our voters uh, passed a $365 million bond referendum. That's an example of capital funds that we uh, use. And, and those uh, are used for buses and uh, library books and things like that as well. So, um, but they cannot be used to pay for the day-to-day -day utilities and associated costs uh, that the general operating fund can be used for. So we looked at a number of considerations for the budget um, as we began the development of this. And we, we spent uh, a lot of time through this process. Um, but we do anticipate some funding shortfalls um, in this upcoming year. Uh, and, you know, although the uh, General Assembly recently passed a continuing resolution uh, for next year, we don't really know the extent of the, of the shortfalls. 
what that continuing resolution basically means is that they are going to fund us at the, the same level uh, next year as, as um, they did this year until they reconvene um, in September and potentially make some adjustments to the budget based on the uh, economic outlook and revenue forecasts for next year. When they come back in September and, and you know, make their recommendations, that does not mean that we could not yet still see another mid-year budget cut. Uh, we've endured those um, over the years a, a number of different times. And so we're, we're trying to be very fiscally responsible and conservative with the development of this budget in anticipation of, of um, something like that happening, given the, the state of the economy and the unknowns related to uh, COVID-19 and, and how it may play out, um, you know, over the next fiscal year. So we anticipate um, coming back to you sometime in the fall after the General Assembly has done their work um, and do some kind of budget amendment uh, to, to make adjustments for whatever additional revenue uh, that the state decides to send our way, if any. Um, they may tell us to hold, hold where we are. Additional considerations uh, that we, we looked at in this budget um, really want to make sure that, that folks understand that we're focused on quality education in Lexington One and, um, and supporting our students and staff as they, as they go through um, you know, what we're enduring right now and also hopefully when, when we get them back in our buildings um, you know, later, later on when it's appropriate. Um, currently, uh, there is no salary or step increases included in the, uh, in the budget at this time. Uh, that's uh, obviously due to the state's uh, continuing resolution being done and no additional funding being provided. Um, the proposed budget is designed to provide for student growth. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we still have students coming into our district. Uh, we don't uh, get to put up the no vacancy sign just because uh, of the continuing resolution. Um, our, uh, our budget does meet state and federal requirements um, and also inflationary costs uh, that are due to us every year. Um, I, I would point out too, that you, you may hear some questions uh, from some, your fellow board members across the state or some of them may say, hey, we passed a continuing resolution just like the state did. You know, why is it Lexington One passing a continuing resolution? Why are we having budget hearings? Um, well, in this district, we have a lot of things going on. Um, and so, Josh, if you'll advance. Uh, you can see um, these uh, priorities for, for the upcoming school year. We're opening Centerville Elementary School. Uh, we're op uh, restructuring Gilbert Elementary and Gilbert Primary Schools in that opening process. We're also relocating Pelion Middle School. Um, we're opening a college center at, at Gilbert High School. Um, and we're also preparing for the unknown impacts from COVID. So uh, it wouldn't be prudent for us to um, pass a continuing resolution because we have new, um, new things going on in our budget that we have to account for. We have a, a school opening in the fall um, and then one opening in January. So we've got to um, provide for those, those uh, differences and that, therefore it's appropriate for us to do a, a budget with hearings um, and go through that process. Josh, go ahead. I mentioned growth earlier. Um, and if you look at our um, average daily membership for uh, this school year, we uh, grew 508 students at uh, the 135th day, uh, which is kind of the, the cutoff day that the state um, measures by. We're projecting uh, some 527 additional students next year um, in, in growth. Um, we did a, a little exercise just because uh, we were curious about the impact of a potential economic recession and how that might affect our growth um, during the upcoming year. Certainly we don't know what uh, the virus impact will, will be on the growth, but we can tell you that back in 07, 08, 09 timeframe when we had the last um, significant economic event, those were some of actually our highest growth years um, in recent history. Uh, we actually were in the seven, 800 student range um, of, of new enrollees during that time frame. So um, we, uh, we don't anticipate uh, at this time uh, that impact to be 
uh, you know, too significant for us as far as new students coming in. And Mr. Salters, is that because of homeschool and private schools, co kids coming back to public school or just uh, do you think people moved in the district or hard to say? Uh, I, I think it's, it's uh, primarily folks moving into the district. Um, and, uh, you know, there is some of the homeschool private school um, scenario come, with folks coming back in or re-enrolling, but I think primarily it's uh, folks moving back into the district. Um, and so, and we'll track that closely with, with home sales and things over, over the uh, course of the year. Um, I, I did want to mention too, that we have, um, it's uh, approximately 847 um, three and four year olds in the district um, at the 135th day of that 2019-2020 uh, number there. So, um, you know, that actually made the, uh, the enrollment uh, 27,354 if you count those three and four year olds. So we're well over 28. Um, I would anticipate us being well over 28,000 um, at the 135th day with total students served um, at the 135th day next year. So um, taking a look at the um, proposed staffing changes, um, I, I just remember that I just said we're gonna grow, um, you know, over 500 students. Um, what we're proposing to do is to do some um, restructuring of our ratios. Um, at the elementary level, uh, we would add a, a student per classroom in uh, kindergarten through uh, second grade. Um, and again, we, we've worked, uh, since Dr. Little's been here, we worked on an initiative to try to reduce those numbers um, pretty significantly. Um, and so this puts the numbers back in the uh, at the at the uh, kindergarten level, it would be 23 uh, to one. Um, uh, first grade and second grade also 23 to one. So that's up from 22 to one um, where they are this year. But you can see by doing that, we actually will lose six FTE at the elementary level. And then at our uh, middle and high school level, um, our human resource department, Mr. Stacy, has has worked really hard with our um, secondary principals to come up with an FTE uh, model uh, that, that allows them um, some flexibility to, to move staff to where the needs, uh, the highest needs are. Um, and we do have kind of a, a bubble of uh, students matriculating up through our, um, our, our growth in, in some of our schools and that's happening at the middle and high school level. And so some of those FTE uh, or shifting that way. And that's why you see the five and a quarter there and the um, 0.75 at the high school level, additional FTE. Uh, we do have some growth in our um, special needs population. And so we've got a, a 7.5 FTE uh, there. Um, we have one additional instructional support staff. And then we have nine additional instructional support staff for special needs. These are not actually new positions. Uh, these are positions that we are picking up um, from the IDEA. Um, we're supposed to be funded at the federal level for IDEA at about 40%. We're actually funded at about 14%. And that ratio is really declining or that percentage is declining. Um, we're having to pick up more and more staff um, through those funds. Um, and so they're, they're moving to general fund. We have two, um, school administrative staff that we um, are reducing and basically we're, we have two assistant principals that <clears throat> through um, some moves and changes uh, are not those positions are not being filled um, in going leading into next year um, supplements additional days and temporary salaries um, we are we have some additional supplements uh, that are that are in the budget currently uh, related to our athletic uh, supplements that were uh, an initiative that was started uh, four years ago now. Um, and we, uh, it was supposed to be a three year phase in and in year three, we split that um, and into two years. And this is the second year of that um, last phase in portion. So it'd be a four year. Those supplements had not been um, addressed in, in over 20 years uh, when we started that process. Um, so that, that makes up the 15 and a half 
additional FTE in the seven hundred thirty-eight thousand uh, dollars to this to the staffing. Thank you, Josh. Looking at our programs and services, um, this is what we affectionately call the accounts payable side of the house, um, and so we are uh, budgeting a, an additional. Um, $300,000 in unemployment compensation reimbursement. Um, this is really a direct impact of COVID-19. Um, we uh, currently budget about $70,000 uh, in this account, and we had spent about $8,000 of those dollars to, to date. We are a reimbursable employer for unemployment, and so and when folks file a claim, um, we end up having to reimburse. We don't have unemployment insurance, um, and that's that's how it, our our setup is structured. And so we've gotten um, some initial inf information that indicates that based on the claims that have been filed, we anticipate um, that reimbursement going up uh, pretty significantly. Um, you know, and and so this is an area that we potentially can offset some. Um, some revenue through the CARES Act and some of the other programs that are coming out. Um, and so right now we, we're showing this as, a, um, as an increase, but eventually we may be able to, uh, to offset these dollars by some federal revenue uh, related to COVID-19, but we're, we're still working through that. Safety and security. Um, this is primarily related to um, the state gave us this year some additional resource officers, uh, which was great. Um, However, they only paid for the salary of those officers, and uh, we have to provide in our under our agreements with um, the uh, municipalities that we work with. The uh, we have to provide the equipment and um, cars, you know, uh, bulletproof vests, et cetera, uh, for the, for those officers. And so this this provides that equipment. Um, it also um, anticipates uh, a 3% uh, salary adjustment for our current uh, SRO staff. We are monitoring the town and, and county budgets uh, to see what they end up with, and we may be able to reduce um, you know, that um, amount should those uh, salaries not increase by that amount. Uh, so we're going to keep an eye on that uh, in future readings. Um, our employee assistance program, uh, this is a new program that we are looking to offer our, uh, our employees. Uh, this is an, an effort spearheaded by our human resource department and Mr. Stacy and his staff have done a really good job of identifying uh, a, a, another way uh, to, to help benefit our employees by providing a, access to a mental health um, program. Uh, and so we're we're pleased to be able to incorporate this into budget and certainly feel um, there are a lot of, of needs in our communities right now. And with our staff, you know, mental health and uh, financial health are all very important at these times. And so we're, we're very interested in providing this, um, this assistance to our employees. <clears throat> Additionally, I mentioned previously about, um, you know, some ongoing uh, inflationary costs, workers comp premium um, kind of falls into that. We, we have a premium adjustment next year based on our activity uh, to date. And so that that's reflected there. So our total increases um, are the 687,960. Looking at some decreases uh, in, in the budget, we, uh, our senior leadership team and our principals uh, really work very hard our, and our, our, our finance staff work really hard looking through the budget, finding ways to to really tighten our belt as much as possible uh, in preparation for uh, the unknowns of, of this coming year. And so we made some cuts in, in some uh, key areas that are reflected here, maintenance and repairs. Uh, this is a, a, a reflective cut from each of our schools. Uh, we feel comfortable with this cut given the, um, the work that's being done through our referendum um, now uh, at, at each of our schools. And so, uh, we feel we feel like th this will be okay. Technology supplies again. We have uh, some funds in our referendum to um, earmark for that were earmarked for technology, and we feel like we can we can work through that. Our school allocations um, we cut that <clears throat> by by ten percent. Um, you know, and, and and taking over uh, 
this role as, as uh, CFO for the district. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to do in, in looking back um, and working with um, our, our finance team, we look back at, um, you know, things that haven't changed in our, our division for a long time. And this is one of the things that has been structured in such a way for, I'd say, probably over 20 years where we have given the same allocation amount out to each school based on um, their enrollment. What we attempted to do this year was make some adjustments to, to that allocation amount, that multiplier, um, using the consumer price index as a guide. Um, and, and we will continue to do that. <clears throat> Basically, we're increasing that multiplier each year by the consumer price index, because we know that that, um, you know, roll of toilet paper 20 years ago doesn't cost what it does today. And maybe that's not a good example because toilet paper is like gold right now, right? Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I was actually a Mother's Day present for my wife. Um, it's a side note. It was a big hit. Um, <clears throat> so um, anyway, we, we've looked at that and um, I did get her some other stuff, by the way. Um, and so um, we looked at that and, and we, we've made attempts to do that. Um, uh, this year, but we still have, have recognized a cut in the overall school allocation. Um, we've also cut supplies, um, and this is a, a, a pretty big cut, and uh, this includes central services, um, uh, our individual di divisions taking a pretty big hit on supplies, and, um, you know, this is one of those things that we're going to be shifting some expenses, some things we have been buying, we're not going to be buying anymore, and some things that we haven't been buying, we're going to be buying a whole lot of. Um, you know, I, I got hand sanitizer on on my mind right now, and I think we're going to be uh, buying a whole lot of that in the in the fall. So, um, additionally, travel, we've reduced uh, travel uh, across the district uh, pretty significantly. We just don't anticipate um, professional development be de being delivered <clears throat> in the same ways in the fall as it is uh, currently. And so we're, um, you know, we've taken a reduction there. Um, Staff Services International Visitor Exchange Program. Um, one of the things that we did um, in, in, uh, as I transitioned into this role <clears throat> and uh, worked with our finance team, and uh, we went through and looked at basically every account in, in our general fund and said, let's look at a budget to actual and where, where are uh, their funds out there uh, that have not been, um, that have been budgeted, that haven't been expended over the course of uh, a few years. This particular area, as well as the people transport area, were two areas where um, we had consistently um, had, had some excess funds. And so we went in and, and uh, reduced those, those budgets um, to, to better reflect the current expenditure levels um, for those those programs. So it doesn't mean we've cut the International Exchange Visitor Program. I don't want anybody to think that. We, we still have the, the money to do that. And that is a program that helps with our um, onboarding of our, our international uh, exchange teachers, uh, many of which teach in our immersion programs, which are really strong in our district. So, uh, and we certainly are still transporting pupils um, around the district, but that was uh, just some excess funds that um, we, we had identified. So total decreases uh, about one point, you know, $1.58 million. Another area um, that, that I, I just mentioned, financial uh, health or economic health, uh, we're very, very focused on that in our, our community. And actually we've been um, having this conversation, I guess going on four years now at least, uh, since Dr. Little has come in and, and really gotten into our system and, and um, looked, at, looked at things. Um, uh, we started out with uh, reducing our uh, supply list, um, elementary teacher supply lists. Uh, that wasn't a board approved fee, but it was a, a, you know, a cost of attending school. And so uh, the charge uh, by Dr. Little was to, to reduce those significantly. And, and that was done uh, two years ago. Last year, uh, we looked very closely at our middle school um, fees and then also at our technology center fees. And so um, there were uh, several fees in those areas last year that were also reduced. And so this year we started looking um, closely at our, our elementary schools and our high schools. 
and we've identified um, these fees listed here uh, for either uh, reduction or elimination. The uh, $6 consumable supply fee uh, for kindergarten, uh, we were proposing to be eliminated. $28 um, grade one through five a consumable fee, uh, we're, we're proposing to be reduced to $20. Um, and then at the high school level, we're proposing the $5 consumable fee be eliminated, uh, the $5 language arts parallel reading fee be eliminated, and then the $25 parking fee uh, be reduced to uh, $5. So um, we, we understand that, that um, you know, this, this can have a, a positive impact on our community at this time and the financial health of our, our, our folks. And we also understand it was an important uh, task of Dr. Little and, and, you know, board members to be able to, uh, to look at this. So um, we're uh, uh, happy to be able to incorporate that into uh, this first reading. Taking a look at our, our projected revenue um, and the changes that we're anticipating, um, our, <clears throat> right now our, our local uh, revenue, um, we're anticipating dropping uh, about $5.3 million. Um, of course, uh, some of that is related to uh, property tax collections and uh, vehicle tax collections and things like that. Uh, it's also related to our um, investment income um, I'm sure many of you are aware of your own um, investments and you see how they're they're operating right now uh, we're, we're you know in a similar situation so uh, we will we anticipate less revenue next year than we have have had in the past um, as I mentioned the continuing resolution um, you know with the state basically we're, we're getting the same allocation of revenue or that's what we're projecting and you say, well, Jeff, that's not the same. Um, you have 174 and there's a 176. And um, you have 8.45, or excuse me, 545, and you have 8.543. The differences there are, those are the actual revenues that we have out, have um, received this year. And so on the left column, you see the approved uh, budget revenue. We actually received more from the state this year than, than we had budgeted. And so we're basing um, the budget on the received revenue um, for next year. You'll notice um, in the, the final column there, the operational balance, um, this current year, uh, we had proposed to use $8.2 million of uh, fund balance. Um, and in the upcoming budget, uh, we're proposing to use um, 3.7 million um, out of that operational balance. Um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Little um, task us with was trying to, you know, figure out a way to minimize that or to be more efficient and minimize that, that operational balance. And then COVID-19 hit. And we decided that, you know, hey, if there's ever a time to, to dip into your rainy day fund, this, this would be such a time. So while we've reduced it, we are still showing some, some use of that operational balance. Mr. Salters, the, um, go back one. The state, so the difference in what was projected for the state and actual, it looks like it was from the penny sales tax set off from Act 388 is really where that, because in one of the charts, it looked like it was about a million two or something like that. That was the difference. It was um, So essentially we had more penny sales tax allocated to us than what we were told by the state. That's right. Okay. Okay, um, on the expenditure side, uh, salaries and related costs, um, our, our approved budget for um, 2020 was 20, uh, 258 million. Um, and you're seeing a proposed budget, um, FY21 of uh, 251 million. I did mention that there were no, um, no raises in incorporated into the budget currently. Um, and I, I didn't say anything about anybody getting uh, salary cuts either. So you're saying, where's the difference there? Well, there's, there's two reasons for that difference. Uh, the first reason is <clears throat> our base budget, overall base budget um, was lower at the start of this uh, budget process. We've had some experienced um, staff members retire um, and some uh, staff members with less experience come in. Um, and so those numbers balance out and uh, can can generate some <clears throat> some lower numbers, but we're also um, 
in, in one of the strategies we're looking at to, um, you know, gain all of our operational efficiencies um, is we're looking at a, a fill ratio of our payroll. Um, historically, we've budgeted our payroll at 100% fill rate, meaning that every position uh, in the in the budget was filled 100% of the time or every day of the contract. Um, and we we typically have not achieved that 100% fill rate because you always have some turnover in staff. Uh, the highest fill rate that we've achieved in the last five uh, years or so is 98%. Um, and we did that, I think, twice, and then it went down to like 95, 94%. And so we're budgeting at a 98% um, fill rate um, for this upcoming budget. Um, and so we, we're, we're going to monitor that each month very closely um, and, and see how that, how that operates for us. But it, it, it does generate um, a pretty significant savings when you're talking about, uh, you know, 2% of $260 million. <clears throat> Um, programs and services, you see the reduction um, there that, that we've already discussed. And so uh, our total budget uh, actually currently um, represents a decrease uh, of $8,022,405, um, going down from $295 million to $287 million. Just a breakdown of um, how the uh, budget is, is um, <clears throat> divvied up, if you will. Uh, you know, the state has some uh, guidelines on salary and, and related cost percentages, instruction, how much of that money goes into instruction, and we, we well exceed that. But you can see, as um, we know, we are, we are in the people business. Um, we, our resources are our teachers. They're the, they're the most valuable resource we have, and so you can see that's where the money um, ends up being spent. Talking about Act 388 uh, briefly, um, the millage rate uh, for um, 2020 is 322.4 mils, um, and the 2021 millage rate um, is 308.86. Um, there's a calculation that's done that, that uh, dictates how much we can go up on our, um, on our millage due to Act 388. Um, and we could potentially go up 12.82 mils. Um, the value of a mill is listed there, 285,445. So that would generate $3.6 million. Um, and <clears throat> um, we are not recommending as part of this budget uh, a millage increase on the operations side. Um, obviously, we have a lot of uh, businesses struggling with the impact of COVID-19. Um, and, and we don't feel like it's um, appropriate uh, for, for us to levy additional mills on them and increase their tax burden at, at this time for our operational budget. So just in summary, um, you know, again, our revenues remain at the, at the state uh, level. Um, and um, our local projections have declined, uh, some due to our um, economic climate and uh, you know some of the actual collection numbers that we're seeing. Um, we are meeting our, our state and federal requirements. Um, we do, we're in, you know, dealing with our inflationary costs. Well, we are opening our, um, our schools that were identified in the 18 referendum building program, restructuring and, and relocating those, those facilities. Um, as I mentioned, it does not include a, a millage increase for operations. And, and just a reminder, um, that there's a budget amendment that will likely be necessary in the fall um, should the General Assembly pass some additional uh, changes to the revenue. Um, and with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Little, you might want to add some comments. I do. Thank you, Mr. Salters. Um, really, I think as uh, the finance team has... Oh, sorry. Have you had that on your bingo card? Hard, you just won. won. Um, um, Really, really, we had, had um, um, I, think I think the conversation, conversation with, uh, uh, among, among the, the team, the finance, the principals, the principals and, and, and uh, central, uh, central services staff. staff. What, I, what think I think this budget does, does maybe more than, than anything else, else um, is, is really, really prepares us, us 
for, for as Mr. Salter started, started, started his presentation, for, for really, really potential budget cuts in the fall. fall. And, and one, one of the things that we really struggled, struggled with was if yeah, we are increasing and adding for programs and the things that we think are important and we think they are good for kids, for sure, and then have to turn around and have to cut those very programs uh, with, with uh, teachers in classrooms, um, things, things already started, started that that could really put, put that could be a really big challenge for our schools. And so, and so I think it's a, it's, a, it's certainly a conservative approach, approach uh, to, to what, what could potentially be a really, a really tough budget, budget year. But, but I, do I do think the budget overall puts us in, in it really puts us in a, a strong position in the event that in September there may be you know, you know whatever, whatever the types, types of things happen when we have to, have to I, don't I don't want to start listing them, them but um, you know, you know if there are budget cuts, cuts uh, we're prepared and uh, we're, we're really anticipating some of those things right now. And then if there aren't those things, then the school district will be in even stronger shape in, in September. Um, but I mean, that was really the thing. So, so the idea that really the continuing resolution thing may work for some people, but uh, the, uh, the truth, truth is, is that we, we really don't think with all the all the COVID-19 COVID impact that we've had, at least over the last nine weeks, weeks 10 weeks, and we potentially continue to see over the summer, summer that um, just didn't, didn't feel right, right for us to, 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 to present a budget, a budget that, way. that way. So you'll, so you'll notice, notice lots of lots of really belt tightening. Um, you know, we really, I really want to commend Mr. Salters. This is your first budget as CFO, and, and uh, really where it's his, his you know, or his, it's his baby from, baby from beginning to end, and, and I feel like, like uh, they've uh, done a, a real masterful job, job with this budget. We can't hear. Can you hear? Okay, can you hear me now? But we, all we can see is the PowerPoint screen as well. Okay, they're fixing that, I think. Um, Mr. Salters, um, I, Enthusiastic about this budget. Um, there are three things in it that, I, that stand out that I really liked um, to see kind of going down the sieve. The big thing is I'm um, delighted to see that we're holding the millage firm um, at this time for our community. I think that's um, the appropriate and wise thing to do. Kind of going down the funnel. Um, I really appreciate the um, the way that you and your staff um, focused on efficiencies and examining the line items and the, uh, historically what those line items and the budget um, have required and what they require going forward. And just the adjustments that you've made there, I think um, it's giving you some breathing room to, um, to keep this budget tight. And then farther down in the funnel as a parent, I'm delighted to see the, um, the parking fee reduction. I think that that is a, um, it's family friendly, especially as we're moving into the uh, next year um, and you know, not knowing what the financial situation of our community is gonna be. Um, I think that's something that um, benefits, you know, thousands of our students. Um, and so I'm really excited to see that. Um, I did wanna make one comment um, too. Um, I remember this from last year. I, I think this question was asked last year um, but it's particularly relevant um, given the, um, on slide nine, the unemployment compensation, that $300,000 increase, that shows up in the budget report under the Board of Education Services. Um, and I remember last year, somebody, we, uh, the question was asked why um, that line item, that expense shows up in the Board of Education. Um, can you um, illuminate that? Just a little bit. I think you said illuminate that, right? Not eliminate that. Illuminate, like ex yeah. explain, okay. explain why that, expand upon that. Explain why that expense is assigned in the BOE. Okay, um, that that uh, assignment is based on the guides uh, from the State Department of Education and, and where they recommend uh, those things being placed, as well as our uh, external audit firms. Okay, thank you. 
Um, it always looks a little out of place on the um, Board sure. of Education thing, but it makes sense because it's an, it's a district-wide expense. It's a district-wide expense, that's um, right. And so the place to have it would be at the at the top level of the budget. So, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, and since I said audit firm, and I'm going to take a minute to do a shameless plug, um, I, we didn't get an opportunity because we haven't done honors and achievements, but I, I did want to uh, take a minute to let the board know that the, the finance team uh, did receive uh, uh, yet another um, outstanding uh, comprehensive annual financial report recommendation. Um, so uh, w won awards for the, the, the this year's uh, capper um, yet again. And so um, I, David uh, Cobb and, and Deborah Seymour are here in the room. And I know uh, Donna Patton and Lizzie Price are at home watching as well. We, we kind of drew straws and I told some of them just stay home. I'm not sure what the room's going to look like. Um, and so, but, but it's, it's a true testament to the work and effort of, of those folks, uh, Tracy Lucas, um, and others in our, our finance office as well, that really, um, do the day-to-day -day work to make sure that, that these numbers, um, uh, are, are accurate and, um, and work with our teams at, at the school level as well. I mean, it's, it really goes down to the, the principals and the, um, the staff at school level too. So really pleased to, to bring that information to you tonight. And um, we're, we're very blessed to have a really strong team um, in finance. So I appreciate that. And I didn't mean to derail the questions, but just want to get that plug in there. And Mr. Salters, that's uh, what, 23 or 24 years in a row. I have to go back and look. I think it might be 24. Yeah. I'll, I'll have that number for you next week. Yeah. And that's on uh, not just out, outstanding performance, but transparency as well. So that's highly commendable. Thank you. And I would just like to say thank you because we had a discussion about whether or not how to handle the budget this year. And I do know that a lot of school districts are just passing a continuing resolution. And it's a lot of work to put this budget together. But I think it's so important because this year is not going to be like any year we've ever experienced. I think y'all already shaking your head. It's already crazy, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I just really appreciate the work and the thought that this that financial teams put together with our principals, with Dr. Little, with Mr. Salters, because I think this year, this piece is going to be so, um, it's just gonna be hard. And we need to do everything we can to protect our students and our learning environment and make sure that we are doing everything to always be the star that Lexington One has always been. And I appreciate you guys really looking hard at this budget and working with, working with every penny. So thank you. Board members, are there any other questions or comments for Mr. Salters? I have a question. I was going to um, make an observation. You know, we're talking about the College Center and standing it up, but I mean, we have a lot of good programs uh, that are up and running that I think the budget puts a spotlight on. And so I was doing some percentages. And again, just looking at English as a second language, uh, we spend about 1.1% of our budget on that. Uh, autism, we spend 0.8% of our budget on that. Um, all of our handicap programs combined together, 3.3% of our budget. Uh, all of our disability programs combined together, that's one of the bigger kind of specialty niche needs is 4.2%. And then early intervention in our four-year-olds is 1.8%. So you add all that up for, you know, your non-traditional student that, uh, you know, just can't the school can go through the normal workflow. That's 11.2% of our budget that we put toward children that need, you know, extra help in our classroom. And obviously, you always have the gifted and talented, and IB and AP, and that's around 1% of our budget. So, again, it's it's impressive all the different ways we meet children where they are um, to meet their needs. So, Thank you, Dr. Powers. I think Ms. Garris has a question. Ms. Garris? Yes. Um, when the state budget is passed, will we be considering a retroactive step increase for employees? Yeah, I've got uh, Ms. Garris asked, I'll just repeat it. Um, when the state budget is passed, will be will be will we be considering a retroactive um, step increase for all employees? And so, Ms. Garris, I, it's my understanding that the the state will, when they do this um, budget session in in the fall, that's what they're considering is whatever step increase it is. It would be for the um, for the fiscal year, so it would be retroactive. That's what we would be looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, I did want to say also, I like, I, I'm actually, um, I'm liking a lot of this budget. Um, I like how you went back and looked at budget 
to actual for past years and historical fill rate. Um, I think that's that's very important. Things in this seven point one million dollar increase. Um, I think if if the board in past years had been looking at the budget to actual and historical fill rate, then this is the amount of money we we could have been saving every year instead of transferring into the capital fund. So I'm very pleased with that um, and the belt tightening and of course no millage increase. So I, I appreciate you going back and looking at all of that. Thank you, Ms. Garris. Uh -huh. Mr. Okay. Salters. Um, yes, sir. So one of the first things, you know, that, that a, a lot of my, myself and my, my small business colleagues did was at the beginning of the pandemic, we immediately instituted a budgetary freeze um, really just kind of hunkered down to, to get a bearing of, of how financially things were going to play out and, and to sort of better prepare in the event. Um, we had um, extended um, uh, other costs, if you will, PPE, so on and so forth. W was there anything similar uh, done with Lexington One in terms of, you know, sort of immediate budgetary freeze at the start of this? I think that's a that's a really uh, good question. Um, we actually um, looked at some uh, may, maybe a, a slightly different strategy. Uh, can you hear me okay, Mr. Guyton? Okay. Uh, we looked at maybe a slightly different strategy, um, understanding what the budget outlook was going to be for this coming year. Um, one of the things that we we had our schools uh, do was look at areas. Um, you know, for the rest of this year where they may not be uh, going to be able to expend funds. Um, I'll give you a good example of that, and that is travel. And so where they had trips um, uh, planned for, um, you know, well, we, dating back from March up and through uh, June for professional development and other things, um, we had them look at those funds because we, we canceled all that travel. We allowed them to redirect that money um, into uh, purchasing supplies and materials uh, for the upcoming year because we, we weren't sure exactly, and as, and as it is reflected in here, a, a, a supply cut for next year, we felt like they needed to do some um, kind of pre-purchase um, in anticipation of some of the cuts for next year. So um, we kind of did a hybrid of what you're talking about. Uh, so we, we did, um, you know, kind of pause some things, but then some other things we allowed um, – allow the schools and, and departments to transfer some money around um, to, to try to go ahead and pre-purchase some things um, in anticipation that, that next year um, it may not be as, as um, optimistic as we would hope. And, and I guess kind of where I'm going with that is it, if we look at our, our sort of fiscal year to date, um, you know, we're at about 83% of the fiscal year yet our expenses reflect around 67% uh, utilization. So the natural thought would be we must have, you know, um, we must have kind of kind of hunkered down there for a minute unless um, we expect to have some, some fairly high expenses going into uh, May and June, um, like a, a, a balance transfer or something along those lines that may would account for that. Is, is there any reason for the lag the 83 versus 67, if you will? Um, I mean, th certainly with us not being in school, um, there, there's a, a natural um, uh, lag, if you will. Uh, you're going to see a, a slowdown in power bills. You're going to see a slowdown in water consumption. You know, different things that, that are monthly uh, expenditures that are going to contribute to that lag. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but you also do have some things in our budget um, that are uh, annualized cost that may renew, um, you know, at the end of the um, at the end of the year. So, so you may have a license, a big software license renewal, uh, maintenance contract on. Um, I think our uh, all of our switching and network gear um, renews at the end of the year, and so um, there there's some things like that that hit that are kind of one time a year costs uh, that will contribute to that uh, to some degree, but but certainly. Um, you know, in general terms, our schools obviously have not been, um, you know, purchasing at the volume that they would have normally this time of year. So we have seen a, a slowdown as a result of that. And, and my yeah. 
question would be, um, so it looks like the main driver for our, our decrease of the budget, if you look at the, at the total budget, the main driver appears to be revenue, uh, decrease in revenue um, as opposed to expense. And so with property tax and, and, you know, historically property tax being a very stable form of income, and especially us being a, a, a growing market like we are in Lexington County, um, have, has anyone at Lexington County given you an idea of why we expect such a, a decrease in property tax um, associated with our local source revenue? Uh, one of the one of the things that you'll um, you don't see on this slide, but you you may can pick up in the um, uh, the individual sheet that uh, was downloaded in the PDF, uh, the the revenue, the breakdown revenue um, document, is you'll see. Um, Hoping you're able to access those documents, Dr. Guyton. If not, we'll, we'll make sure you, you get a copy of them. Um, the, the tax levies um, that um, were, were the first line item in that um, uh, sheet that I'm talking about, sure. you'll see a, a, a three million dollar decrease in that tax levy, um, and, and you know that's a that's a decrease reflected in in uh, last year um, uh, when that budget was developed. Um, you know, the, the projection was a $66.7 million uh, revenue estimate. And we, we have this year collected around 63 million. Um, so what we, what we did is we realigned um, that revenue with, with what we actually collected. So I, I wasn't willing to go off of just a budget number. Um, I really wanted to base it, ba you know, on, on our true collection number. Um, and, and Ms. Seymour in our, in our office really worked hard to, to, to get these numbers together. And we talked through that and that's, that's where we were comfortable. So, um, you know, we, we could budget if you go back and look at trends, um, over the last few years and I could pull that for you, but, um, you're probably going to see that, that number, um, consistently, um, over collection budgeted over collection. Um, and, and so we just, we just try to true that up. So, um, you know, not all of that is a result of, um, you know, the, the COVID um, impact or the economic impact. It's, it's a result of, of our work to, to align that, that projection with the actual collection, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Salters? I just like, like to say thanks to Jeff because I know how difficult it is for not just principals but everybody in the school system when you got to go in September and October and cut a budget. That's very, very painful. So uh, I, I appreciate your for, foresight on that and, and looking into the future. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, we won't have to do that. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Um, Mr. Salters, will you remind us um, the schedule for the next budget reading and where we go from here? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you for that that prompt. I'll I'll be happy to do that. So, uh, we will uh, conduct second reading of the budget on our June second board meeting. I believe it is the date of that meeting, um, and then we will c uh, conduct third uh, reading. We'll have a budget hearing at uh, the June eighteenth. Um, it's the eighteenth, right? Not somebody help me. Yeah, the eighteenth. Um, June 18th meeting, um, and we will uh, do a budget hearing at that meeting, and then you guys will actually um, take a uh, vote and, and um, on the on the budget at that at that meeting. Okay. I'm sorry, it's the 16th Tuesday, which is your regularly scheduled um, board meeting in June. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salters, and that will not be a Zoom meeting. It will be a regular meeting. We will not be Zooming after tonight unless something crazy happens. And we will have a regular meeting. And I just would like to remind our constituents that we are here, that you, if you have questions, comments, concerns about the budget, you may call us, email us, text us, or come in person and address the whole board or send us a letter. So uh, we welcome hearing from our constituents. Uh, thank you, Mr. Salters, and thank you, financial team, for all that you did to put that together.